Grace Church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning to our chapel online. Uh, we're here to bless and rejoice and give our hearts to God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Please join me. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Exodus, chapter 32, beginning at the first verse. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, Here's your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burned offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped and sacrificed to it and said, Easy your gods, O Israel, 
who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Philippians. My brothers and sisters, 
whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? and he was speechless. 
Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Missing what made me pull out my hair has only deepened my grief. This is what love does. It pierces. Anyone who has lost a loved one often enters into suffering that no container can hold. It's not big enough. It just isn't. Yet, thank God, even the memories of the pain of our love has the potential to become sweet as we learn to walk anew. This morning, I would like to suggest that my friend's experience with grief mirrors one of the infinite ways that God connects with us. God loves and misses even what drives God crazy about us. And like in any relationship, if we are missing an action, absent from our connection to God, there is grief on God's part. There is pain. God hurts. God misses us. Even the crazy stuff about us. Yet God is always faithful and continues to walk with us on our path, calling out to us to be with divine presence. As the reading in Exodus reminds us, Moses comes to God and changes his God's mind. God's mind can change in that passage. And also one of the readings for this week is from Isaiah, a later prophet, who says that God's shroud will spread over all peoples. God will swallow up death for all, forever. God will wipe away our tears on all faces. And the translation in the psalm, the 23rd psalm, my favorite, one of my favorites, if you know at the very end, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, is not a radical enough translation. In the Hebrew, it says that mercy, goodness and mercy shall pursue us all the days of our lives. Pursue. God pursues us, walks with us in our valley of death shadows, whether we are with God or not. None of God's abiding love depends on our willingness to love back. And Jesus was relentless in his message that God pursues us no matter what. 
Don't constrain God's crazy love for us. Don't constrain God's limitless mercy for us. God is tirelessly preparing feasts for us always. A feast so great that even at the table of death, which we designed when we tried to kill Jesus, when we tried to kill love, is transformed. That table is transformed. It becomes our table, our altar of life everlasting. I think that one of the worst lies perpetrated upon and by the religious is that heaven is only for certain people, the good ones. Heaven by its nature will keep some people out, but hopefully if we follow the right way, we will be blessed to walk through those pearly gates. We hope so anyway. This image completely defies what Jesus says. How is it that we so easily forget that Jesus hung out with the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the ostracized, the sinners, the poor, the sick, and the maligned, the known bad of Jesus' day, the horribly shamed, no heaven for them? How often did Jesus say that the least, the lost, the lonely, the last will be first. Think again, Jesus would say. The kingdom of God is now. You are in it. We are all living within the reign of love. One of the reasons I'm spending time in this beginning of this sermon is reiterating God's loving nature and Jesus' repeating message because we need to keep this in mind when we hear the parable of Matthew this morning. I mean, frankly, last week I was like, really, I have to preach on that? <laughs> As we interpret this gospel story, we need to rest in God's shocking, unrelenting, outrageous love for us and Jesus' willingness to die in defense of this love. This parable cannot be about some loser who shows up without the right wedding robe. And by the way, this dude is just pulled off the street last minute. How could he be prepared? And then presumably, by no fault of his own, is thrown into the outer darkness of hell. Will there be weeping and gnashing of teeth? Who can love an arbitrary God like this? This cannot be the interpretation. God's word won't have it. God's word and Jesus' life defy this interpretation. So here's the million dollar question. If this is not about heaven and hell, and who's in and who's out, then what's this parable about? Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? In the Hebrew and Greek language, robes as outer garments function as a symbol, as a metaphor a garment that signifies your authority in who you are. The way you dress is like the way you would make a vow at a wedding ceremony to express a stance, an outlook, a promise. In other words, what you're wearing signifies your approach in life. Friend, the king says, friend. It's actually a gentle, loving address. It can, be for, it can be translated as, friend, you have life before you. Why are you dressed for it? We offered you a wedding gown when you came in. How is it that you're showing up this way, so unprepared? 
Or as the poet Mary Oliver asked in her poem, The Summer Day, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, friend, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? This is the king's question, a question that cuts to the core of our existence, our stake in life, our choices, our hopes, our dreams, ways we find meaning and sustenance. Our heart should be beating when we hear this question. How are we showing up to this gritty, messy, exuberant, thrilling, life of ours? What clothes are we putting on to participate in this feast? In other words, what's your attitude, your stance, your outlook, your commitment? Notice that the guy off the street is speechless. I think maybe this is one of the most poignant movements in, all, in this parable. Are we speechless when asked about the significance of our lives? Maybe we are, because that is the question of life. Where and how do you find meaning? Maybe his silence is in response to the magnitude of the question. So, do we continue to be speechless. In the end, if we don't have an answer, or if our answer is tied up in addictions and greed or ugly cynicism or racism, you can add to that list, then aren't we in a living hell of our own making? thrown in the outer darkness of violence, and in the end, irrelevant and inconsequential, tormented with tears and gnashing of teeth in our meaningless or mean-filled, wasted life. Yikes, I mean, really. Yet if our speechlessness, our, our, our silence for a while, is in awe and wonder at the question, with a curiosity of how we can lean into our wild and precious life, then I believe we can commit to becoming a blessing to the world. This morning, I would like to extend the King's challenge. Not only is this question asked of each one of us, because we're at the wedding party in this parable, each one of us is being asked, but I think something else is going on here. I think the church, the broader church, the Catholic church, Christianity, the church, is also being asked. Church, what is it you plan to do with your wild and precious life? I have a few ideas I'd like to share with you about our clothes, our wedding robe, as we vow to make a difference in the world. How can the church, the church as a body of the living Christ, make a difference in our world. I think we need to share the message of God's love for all of us, infinitely, no matter what. You'll get used to me as a preacher. This is maybe my ongoing theme. I say it all the time. But I don't think as church we say it enough. The world needs our unflinching confidence in this abiding love. I also believe we need to embrace humanity as more than Mr. Adam and Mrs. Eve. We are more than this. Man, woman, trans, queer, 
white, black, other, rich, poor, victim, perpetrator, have, the have not, sinner, saint, and everything in between. We need to remind the world that Adam, the Hebrew word means earth creature, coming out of Adama, the earth, that we are not us and them, that we belong together. We are woven strand by strand. We are intimately bound with each other and to our mother earth, Adama, never privileging one people over another. God has included God's name in our, our name, in all names. All are the, we have the power to be the divine spark, to reflect God's love. And so as church, I think we need to invite each other into the power of our questions, into the patience of listening, into the shared suffering, our own hurts, our healing, and our hope. I don't know about you, but this week has been very dispiriting at best as we see this war unfolding between Gaza and Israel, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. How can we as church respond to this terrible crisis? If not, to speak to humility, our need for humility, to grief, the shared grief, and to the truth that no one is privileged over another, recognizing both the horrors of occupation and terrorism. Can we voice the need to recognize that there's an arrogance to certainty and a need for a type of security that is the opposite of faith. In the end, how we answer this king's question really matters. Are we dressed for action that invites all of us to this precious life by honoring all our different histories, our stories, our dreams, and in the end, everyone's dignity. For the life of the church, this commitment to honoring all people begins at our table, begins here, our altar, our feast. The children today are learning about the Eucharist, and we're going to have a tour of the sacristy with them after church. It's at this table where, remember, the attempt to squelch life was defeated and transformed into life love. This table does not belong to Grace Church. It doesn't belong to the Episcopal Church. It doesn't belong to the greater churches. It's God's table. It's God's, our Creator, who says repeatedly, with and without words, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome to eat at my table. And with that food, you can dress for action as you become a part of making a meaningful and blessed life, to become a part of the kingdom of God on earth. Wherever you are, sinner, saint, soldier, come and feast. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, but the one being of the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand. which can be found in the Book of Common Prayer, page 389. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, and be found without fault on the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our presiding bishop, for our own bishop, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. The Lord have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. We pray to you, O Lord. The Lord have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in a faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the prosecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, for those who are present and those who are absent, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do. We pray to you, O Lord. The Lord have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the communion of your church, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but eternal life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Michael and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our Lord. To you, o Lord our God.
Let us pray for the needs and concerns of this community. For the clients, staff, and volunteers of the 1269 Cafe. For lasting peace between Israel and Palestine. For our refugees and for those who support them. For all church leaders in every order of ministry, especially our own vestry and wardens. For our parish as we discern how to be the body of Christ in the world today. For Rector Marjorie and her family. For the young family. For Jason, Jeff, and Sonia. For the Thomas family, the O'Brien family, the Ancora family. For Paula in her last days. And for all those for whom no one prays. For whom else shall we pray? Pray for the children who are the victims of war. Steve Smiley. I ask your prayers for all in need of God's healing power, for Jim, Carrie, Kate, Kitty, Autumn, Chris Ann, Mark, Lori, Fred, Kate, Frank, Judy, Warren, Liz, Jackie, Greg, Patty, Ed, Mary Lou, John, Steve, Chrissy, Anthony, Steve, Patty, Bob, Eric, Janet, Chuck, Cameron, Mary Alice, Chris, and Clement. For whom else shall we pray? I ask your prayers for those who have died, remembering especially Evelyn Mason, Marjorie Rogers, Annalisa Lars' daughter, and Charles W. Kuhn, and for all who have perished in Gaza and Afghanistan. May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace, and let light perpetual shine upon them. For whom else shall we pray? Let us give thanks for all the blessings of this life, especially for the lives and memories of those in whose honor the flowers and sanctuary light are given today, and for Reverend Jamie's presence with us, and for this parish community. For what else shall we give thanks? We pray for our Sunday school teachers and our children in Sunday school. For yours is the majesty, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by all we have done, and by all we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we will humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Let us share with each other a sign of Christ's peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace, everyone. Thanks, all.
Still there? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Oh. 
right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ, our Lord, to show forth your glory in the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, whoever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Live knowing that God loves you like a mother, has clothed you with clothes in which you can reflect the love of God, and will be nurtured always in the shadow of death. The blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer be with you today and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely no idea. Uh,